1941, as World War II raged in Europe, the city of Zagreb was the capital of the independent state of Croatia. For centuries, Croatia had sought unsuccessfully to realize its destiny as a fully independent nation embodying the fundamental principles of freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Although Croatia had achieved independence, World War II was a complex time of domestic and foreign aggression, dubious allegiances, and conflicting interests. The independent state of Croatia found itself under the influence of both the German and Italian military and police formations, the well-financed Serbian paramilitary Chetniks and Tito's Stalin-backed communists. The young Croatian state faced those challenges at the military, political, and diplomatic levels. One could argue that no other nation drawn into World War II experienced as many conflicts of competing interests within the confines of its borders as did the tiny nation of Croatia, that beautiful piece of real estate nestled along the Adriatic coast. Over the course of the war, Croatia became the unlikely host and protector of nearly a hundred U.S. airmen who had crash-landed there and had been taken prisoner by the Croatian armed forces. The fate of the American POWs lay in the uncertainties of the terrifying political and military drama that was unfolding. Through the personal accounts of several of the POWs, as well as that of a young American priest whom faith and war placed in their midst, we follow the events that transpired. Our film relies on the scholarship of Charles Michael McAdams, historian, journalist, U.S. Marine, defender of truth, educator, and true American friend of Croatians. The author of numerous books and more than 100 articles on Croatia, including Croatia Myth and Reality, which saw three English language editions, McAdams' voice was authoritative and respected internationally. For years, he hosted the much-followed Moments in Croatian History, a weekly Croatian radio program in California. McAdams was a member of numerous Croatian associations across America, as well as a guest lecturer at universities in the United States, Australia, and in Croatia after it gained its independence in 1991. Michael McAdams was one of the founders of the Croatian Information Service in 1974, along with Damir Radoš, Peter Radiolovic, and Zvonko Brbanic. His work aided in lifting the fog that hung over Croatian history in America and beyond, and aided in the fight for Croatian independence. For his services to Croatia, President Franjo Tuchman awarded him the Order of Danisa Hrvatska, the Order of the Croatian Morning Star for Culture, with the image of Marko Maralic. McAdams became interested in the fate of the World War II American airmen held prisoner in Croatia. Through his investigations, he was able to locate those American airmen who were still living to learn about their wartime POW experiences firsthand. The primary purpose of his study was to present documentary evidence concerning the treatment of these Americans while in captivity. McAdams examined the earlier history of Croatia to better understand the contemporary situation. He noted that after the end of World War I and with it the end of the Habsburg Empire, Croatia faced brutal and intensely political, economic, and cultural subjugation. Repeated attempts by the Croatian political leadership to honestly participate in true reconciliation among the regional post habsburg states to formulate equitable solutions for all fell victim to Serbian greed for expansion and their openly professed ideology of Greater Serbia. That imperialist ideology manifested itself under the Kingdom of Serbs, Croatians, and Slovenians 1918 to 1929, and later under the unilaterally proclaimed dictatorship of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia 1929 to 1941. Both of these regimes, including a brief eight-month interim of Banovina, a regional political formation, 
were controlled by the Karadjordjevic dynasty under Serbian King Alexander and his successor Peter II. Both forcefully promoted the Serbian expansionist genocidal document Natchitanje, which insisted on the complete eradication of Croatians as an imperative to Serbian territorial expansion. The Kingdom of Serbs, Croatians, Slovenes, was created to represent an important factor in the preservation of the Versailles Treaty and the English-French political military system. The Anglo-French alliance, supported by the totalitarian USSR, created a cordon sanitaire around Germany, thereby isolating the largest economic competitor of England and France. This was a precursor to the artificial political creation, which came to be known as Yugoslavia. Under one name or another, for 23 years, the most brutal methods of the time were sanctioned, financed, and imposed on the Croatian people by the Serbian King Alexander and Peter II governments in Belgrade, involving the dissolution of the centuries-old Croatian parliament and the abolition of municipalities, provinces, schools, and judicial systems. The arbitrary and capricious military imposition of taxes. The nationalization of state properties, including forests, mines, public buildings, and monetary fund. The systematic denial of Croatian language and the arrogant theft of Croatian culture sanctioned and financed Serbian paramilitary terrorism on Croatian soil, violation of human rights, denial of free speech, due process, assembly, and suffrage. The list of grievances was long and real. By any definition, this was genocide in progress. During this period, from 1918 to 1941, Croatian political leaders at home and emigres in the U.S. and Canada created countless petitions and memoranda intended to inform influential governments, including France and the U.S., of the dire situation and to request assistance and or intervention. In May 1919, Stepan Radic presented a petition with seeking an end to Serbian oppression and the violation of human rights to the peace conference in Paris. It included 150,000 signatures, along with a note indicating that an additional 450,000 signatures had been illegally seized by the Yugoslav government. The grievances were heard, but ignored. Requests for assistance and intervention were marginally considered and tabled. The Croatian people were left to suffer the indignities and brutal institutional and state oppression alone. The lack of morality of the leading European nations was notorious and manifested itself in illegal treaties and denials of oppression at every international forum of the time. As early as April 26, 1915, a secret agreement between Britain and Italy, the so-called London Treaty, guaranteed parts of Croatian territory, Istria and Dalmatia, as Italy's reward for entering the war on the side of the Triple Entente. Although the treaty was not implemented, the precedent was set, and five years later the Serbian-dominated government in Belgrade revived the issue of turning over Croatian territories to Italy by signing the Rapallo Treaty on November 12, 1920. In simple terms, the treaties represented the sale of Croatian lands to Italy. However, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson directly intervened, successfully arguing that the majority population of these territories was Croatian, not Italian. The United States was the one and only just nation. On June 20, 1928, a mass assassination attack on Croatian deputies in the Belgrade Parliament was carried out by Serbian deputy Bonisha Ratic. He killed three prominent Croatian politicians, Stepan Radic, Pavle Radic, and Juro Pasaricek, and wounded two Croatian deputies, Ivan Pernar and Ivan Granja. 
Serbian King Alexander was widely held responsible for supporting these assassinations, having brutally removed the opposition on January 6, 1929. He proclaimed a dictatorship and changed the country's name to Yugoslavia. After a decade of state-sponsored criminal abuse, this was a formal negation of Croatian national identity. Stefan Radic was a visionary Democrat, Vlatko Macek, a Federalist, thus a supporter of the monarchy, succeeded Radic. Neither by his merit nor exceptional talent or intellect. He failed to understand and act on the rapidly evolving world events. Milan Shufly was a Croatian historian and politician who was murdered by members of the Yugoslav regime's organization, Young Yugoslavia, a group financed and protected by Serbian King Alexander. On February 16, 1931, Dr. Shufly was ambushed and killed on his doorstep in Zagreb his skull crushed with a hammer. Yugoslav state-sponsored intimidation of the civilian population and the murder of dissenting intellectuals was commonplace and ongoing. Albert Einstein and Heinrich Mann sent a letter to the International League of Human Rights in Paris protesting the murder of Milan Shufly to the global cultural community. They appealed for protection of Croatian scientists from the Yugoslav regime. The appeal made the front page of the New York Times on May 6, 1931. It directly accused Serbian King Alexander of complicity in the crime. Dr. Ante Pavlic was born in Herzegovina, Croatia. He completed studies in law, was an elected deputy in the parliament, and vice president of the Bar Association in the year of Radic's assassination. Two days after the proclamation declaring the Yugoslav dictatorship in January 1929, Pavlic escaped to Vienna, having been sentenced to death in absentia by the Serbian king's court. Pavlic founded the revolutionary organization called Uprisers. For crimes committed against the Croatian people, the uprisers sentenced King Alexander to death and executed that sentence in 1934 in Marseille during the king's visit to France. Pavlic's revolutionary activities continued in Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Italy. He would not return to Croatia until April 14, 1941, four days after the proclamation of Croatian independence. It was on April 10, 1941, that Colonel Slavko Kwaternik proclaimed the birth of the independent state of Croatia in the name of Dr. Ante Pavlic, the exiled revolutionary leader of the Croatian uprisers. The proclamation was received by the Croatian people with enthusiasm and was seen as a victory after 23 years of Serbian genocidal policies toward the Croatian people. The call for liberation was clear and seen as just. The response of the nation was spontaneous and overwhelming as the law of self-preservation took precedence. John James Miley, the American consul in Zagreb, reported on the events as they happened. Dr. Macek's demand that the Croatians and the Yugoslav army should fight for the Serbs was the last straw. Mutiny of the Croatian officers and enlisted men had already started. Serbian officials in Zagreb prepared to leave the city. On April 10, at noon, the cabinet chief of the Croatian parliament informed this office that it was finished with Yugoslavia. After the proclamation of the independent Croatian state, the loosely organized students, workers, and intelligentsia deposed the Yugoslav government with minimal casualties before the arrival of the first contingents of the German and Italian armies, their political attaches and diplomatic corps. Croatia was de facto and de jure, recognized by 25 states and legations in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. If Germany was surprised by Croatia's early proclamation of independence, Italy was furious. Mussolini wanted no independent Croatia. 
he had the grandiose dream of restoring the ancient glory of the Roman Empire by seizing all of Croatia's territory. The German army advanced into Croatia from the north and the Italian Second Army from the west. The country was occupied by Germany and Italy splitting Croatia in half under their respective influences. In previous history, Patriot Ante Starcevich had said Croatia wanted to be free from subjugation, not to exchange one subjugation for another. However, in the whirlpool of world conflicts, that is precisely what happened, opening new fronts of confrontation with long-term consequences. Twelve Italian divisions, 200,000 Italian troops of the 2nd Italian Army marched into Croatia through Slovenia and the Adriatic coast. That prompted immediate diplomatic negotiation between Croatia's new government and the Italians, which led to the Pact of Rome that relinquished to Italy part of the Dalmatian coast. The signing of the pact resulted in a temporary alleviation of tensions but paved the way to a long-term tragedy for the Croatian nation. In short, Croatia wanted its independence. Italy wanted Croatia to become its colony. Germany accepted Croatian independence with the expectation that Croatia would be incorporated into the domain of the Reich to counteract Italian expansion. Croatia's 1,300-year-old dream of independence was shattered. Occupied, in facing the domestic rise of Tito's communists, the country became a killing ground. With America's entry into the war, American planes joined the air war, bombing German sites. Many U.S. bombers hit by German flak or suffering heavy damage in aerial combat with the German Air Force flew over Croatia as they attempted to return to Italy from their bombing missions. American bombers crash-landed all across Croatian territory. Those airmen who survived were picked up by the regular Croatian army and treated as prisoners of war. McAdam investigated the treatment of these American POWs held in Croatia between 1941 and 1945. In the late 70s, he tracked many of them down, created questionnaires, conducted interviews, and documented their experiences. Billy T. Turner was perhaps the most unusual of all the American POWs. In late 1943, an American fighter pilot, Billy T. Turner, landed his plane in eastern Bosnia. That sector was controlled by the Croatian Armed Forces. During the landing, the American officer suffered a fracture of his shoulder bone. Croatian guards took the officer to the battalion's hospital in Rogatica. He was retained there by a young officer from Zagreb, who acted as an orderly. The American officer asked not to be turned over to the Germans or to the partisans. From that time on, he lived and worked with Croatian soldiers. I was surprised with their fighting strength, optimism, and spirit. Also, I was not only surprised by the determined stand of the Croatians against the communist partisan, but also by the resistance of Croatians to Germans in their country. This small unit where I was constantly resisted a German battalion which tried to force them out of Rogatica. Croatians wanted to be neither communist nor Nazi. They only wanted an independent state of Croatia. My 21st mission targeted fortified manufacturing plants in Vienna, Austria. German guns had the Americans' number on March 22, 1945. Four of the nine B-24s in my formation took on heavy fire and scattered. We could not get back over the Alps on our return because of the damage. We crippled back over Croatia, lost altitude badly and had to bail out. I was the last man who ever spoke to the pilot, George Conaway from Texarkana, Texas. <laughs> we were at 2,000 feet and falling fast. He told me to get the hell out of the plane, and I jumped. Somersaulted through the sky, pulled my ripcord, and I fell hard to the earth. My parachute shot up from German soldiers on the ground. The plane crashed into a hillside, killing George, our pilot, instantly. Of the nine of us who jumped, four escaped. Germans found five crewmen, including me. 
I was knocked unconscious by the fall. All of us were taken prisoner and paraded before the locals in a nearby village. I was moved to a prisoner of war camp at Zagreb, where I served three months. Father Benkovich was an American-born Catholic priest. He finished all of his schooling in the United States. In 1938, he was sent by his superiors to Mostar, Herzegovina, to complete his theology studies and to obtain a better knowledge of the Croatian language. He was in Croatia until July 1945. Father Benkovic visited the POW camp in Zagreb on the estate of Baroness Vera Nikolic Podrinska, where he met with his fellow Americans. A couple of days before Palm Sunday in March 1945, I was told that there was a POW camp at 203 of Pantovchak Road in Zagreb. So I went there to see my fellow Americans. The American airmen were given a radio by the Croatian pilots and their commander, uh, Dubai and they listened to American and British stations. Uh, they listened to it every day. The camp had no enclosure around it, and there was uh, only one guard up on a hill. Uh, visitors could uh, visit the camp at any time. I said mass every Sunday for the guys in the home of uh, Baroness Vera Nikolic, a grand lady, much beloved by the American airmen as their Croatian mother. Over the course of the war, the Baroness became the unlikely host and protector of nearly a hundred U.S. airmen who had crash-landed in Croatia and been taken prisoner by the Croatian armed forces. Baroness Nikolic considered the airmen her guests and afforded them the best treatment available given the wartime conditions. At Christmas and Easter, Baroness Nikolic organized a celebration at her home to which she invited the American, British, Australian, and South African airmen. MJF's statements note that the Croatians treated them better than their own troops. I'll say this, the people there, the Croatians, they treated us better than their own troops. They did the best they could for us. Sometimes the food wasn't great, but we ate out of the same pot as the guards. We got what they got, and compared to Germany, that camp was a resort, a Boy Scout camp. I can't say one word against those people. They were simple people, some of them, but I think they were good people, and they didn't want to hurt me any more than I wanted to hurt them. On Christmas 1943, some women came out from the Croatian Red Cross and brought us some goodies. A couple of them had been out before. It was real nice. American POWs were treated in Zagreb's finest hospitals. Chief of State Dr. Ante Pavlic often visited these men to see that they were in every way well treated and cared for. The daughter of the late Croatian Chief of State, Vizna Pavlic, confirmed that she accompanied her father, Dr. Ante Pavlic, on his visits to the hospital Rebro in Zagreb. Marvin Cropper stated that, We often worked in the grape vineyards of Baroness Nikolic. We got paid with wine for our work. Uh, around camp, there was no fences and little was done to prohibit escape. A Croatian officer at the time, uh, at the camp, warned the POWs to stay clear of the SS men. They were not only allowed visitors, but some had Croatian girlfriends in Zagreb who saw them frequently. These letters from Biljana and photographic evidence presented says more about this than did any of the former POWs who were reluctant to speak about this aspect of their stay in Croatia. John LaRue stated that. Each time we would fly a different airplane. This time I remember the plane was the Sky Pirate. We were hitting the right wing. Pretty big hole really. Over Graz in Austria. We thought we were landing in Budapest, Hungary. I don't think we could have gone any further. The navigator could have made a mistake too. We landed right on the front lines. The guys in the Croatian army were right in front of us, toward the river. He, we came in behind them. Pilot Benkowski brought it in right where we were. American photo reconnaissance planes had taken pictures of the planes and had found that they were intact. 
the Americans wanted to destroy them so that the Croatians, or whoever, couldn't use them. It was on the third day, early in the morning, that three P-51s came up over the brow of the hill. They set both aircraft on fire. An order then came in from the Croatian Air Force and we were transported to the Air Force headquarters building in Zagreb. John LaRue stated that American POWs were in the Air Force building in downtown Zagreb for about five or six days. While they were there, the Americans bombed the city on a few occasions. I remember we'd go to the basement and stand in the doorways and you could feel the concussion. It was kind of an eerie feeling knowing that you were bombed by your own plane. Work was assigned in the camp to non-coms and officers. Records were kept of all their work so that they could be paid after the war as provided for by the Geneva Conventions. Given the chaotic situation at the end of the war, you were given vouchers instead of cash. One time the Croatian Red Cross brought us some packages. I think there was a half pound of sugar, a half pound of rice maybe, maybe a little salt. LaRue pointed out that the Baroness looked after the American POWs in the camp, offering safety, security, and making certain that their treatment conformed to international law and the Geneva Conventions. The Baroness was a warm, gracious woman. When we were around her, we remembered our own families, and she wanted us to feel safe, normal. Small kindness, cookies, tea, smiles, concern about our health and well-being. The attitude of the Croatians was that when the war ended, the Americans would help the Croatians who feared the Russians and the communists. We had dignitaries come out to us just before the end of the war. I don't know who they were. They talked about the Bolsheviks and what they would do and how they feared them. We had an interpreter named Vladimir Dubai. He had quite a bit of education. He became attached to the camp and acted as our interpreter and liaison. He and Edward J. Binkowski from Westford, uh, Westford Mass were given this plane that would have been like a, a small private plane in the country. It was a Croatian Air Force plane. He flew this Vladimir Dubai south, I think to split. He was going to see if he could negotiate with them for us, and they shot him. Tito's partisans shot him. In a letter to McAdams, the senior American officer, Lieutenant Colonel Paul E. Hardin, stated that in his association with the independent state of Croatia and their authorities, their actions were exemplary and adhered to international law. In early 1945, an attempt was made to evacuate American pilots from what was soon to be a war zone as the Red Army moved toward Zagreb. Croatian Air Force General Rupcic saw to it that 12 American pilots were trained in the use of Croatian aircraft. These were the 12 planes which represented the last hope for the air defense of Croatia's capital. The 12 American pilots and one Croatian liaison officer flew to Italy via Zadar. These airmen attempted to convince the American army to land on the Dalmatian coast to meet the Red Army at the Drina River. This was the second attempt by Croatians to convince the Allies that an American landing in Croatia would shorten the war. In 1943, Croatian Lieutenant Colonel Ivan Babic had flown to American-occupied Italy to suggest to the Americans that such an evasion would meet no resistance from Croatian forces, and that the Croatian army would even establish a beachhead for them. The American command recognized that the Balkan region was an area of vulnerability for Hitler, and that such an attack could split the German army. Of course, neither the American nor Croatian commanders could have known that Roosevelt Churchill and Stalin had already carved up Europe and that the Balkan area was designated for the Soviet Union. The American and British forces continued to fight and die in Italy. In 1945, just a few days after the end of World War II, 
Tito and his communist partisans initiated an extermination campaign against men, women, and children they viewed as enemies of the regime. The mass slaughter began with the repatriation of 700,000 Croatian and Slovenia civilians and soldiers who fled to Austria, seeking asylum immediately at the close of the war to escape the victorious communists. The refugees were deceived into believing they were being sent to the American safe zone in Italy. Instead, they were loaded onto trains and sent back to Yugoslavia. Large numbers were massacred outright upon their return. Others died on forced death marches and in mass executions across the country. The Croatians, who had protected our American pilots, now faced shockingly harsh reprisals. With Tito's assuming power in the country, he began to transform Yugoslavia into a dictatorship of the proletariat. Baroness Vera Nikolic Prudinska was imprisoned, her villa and sprawling estate confiscated and dynamited. On the very spot where it stood, Tito had a grand presidential palace erected that serves that function still today. Communist ideology justified the seizing of private property of Croatian civilians and nobility, as well as the banishment and murder of people viewed as enemies of the regime. All of the American POW airmen remained safe and protected until the end of the war when they were safely repatriated to their units. Their protectors did not fare as well. The war and its aftermath were costly. The Croatian population was decimated. Their political system scarred deeply. The Baroness, by then in her 70s, had two art exhibitions in the United States in 1966. She and I reunited in Columbus, Ohio. It was deeply touching to see her again. She autographed a painting for me. It says, to my old friend, Jean Keck, in remembrance of bygone days. The painting adds warmth, history, and color to my home. The Baroness's gift hangs a few feet from my living room memorial, featuring a photo of my bomber crew a B-24 model, my ripcord handle, a shadow box that contains my nine medals, and a photo of my buddy, George Conway from Texarkana. According to John LaRue, in his interview with McAdams, he was guest of honor in 1979 at a Los Angeles Creation Day celebration. Let me say also, in 1979, I was a guest of honor at a Los Angeles Creation Day celebration. I announced then that I still had my voucher and vowed to cash it in when Croatia gained its independence. It would be 45 years before they finally established an independent democratic country in 1991, which is today the Republic of Croatia. The deep internal divisions are healing the painful but liberating process of seeking truth and reconciliation is underway. The enormous strength, dignity, humility, and decency of the Croatians who protected the American pilots and prevailed against Serbian aggression in the Croatian War for Independence point to a bright, beckoning future. Our American airmen survived, not by chance, but due to intervention and protection offered by political, military, and religious leaders, as well as private citizens in Croatia. While the American airmen all returned home safely from Croatia at the end of the war, that wasn't the case for Croatian airmen. Many of them were killed by Tito's partisans after the war was over. Croatian Air Commander Vladimir Dubai who tried to negotiate with the partisans for the transfer of United States airmen to a safe zone was shot on the spot. May he and other Croatians who gave our American pilots safe shelter during those harsh times 
forever be remembered for their bravery and their kindness. I had a month to wait before the war was really over there. On June 16th or 17th, then we flew out in B-26s. I could have flown home, but opted not to. The air thick with life or death memories. Instead, I and 49 fellow POWs boarded a converted luxury liner. We landed in Virginia and all 50 of us stepped off that ship, got down on all fours and kissed the ground. We were darn happy to be home. I never expected to see the U.S. again. I can truthfully say I am one who beat the 100 to 1 odds of getting home. I have seen and experienced so much, but I could never for one second cast from my mind the tragedy of the Croatian people. I am grateful to remain alive so that I can tell the truth to the American public about Croatia and World War II. When I got back to the States, I heard some stories about the mistreatment of American POWs in Croatia. I was particularly disturbed by the misstatements of facts by one of the writers of the New York Daily News, Paul Meskel. On Friday, July 19, 1974, an article written by Mr. Meskel stated that American airmen were killed by the dozens in Croatia. His comments ran counter to everything I experienced firsthand with American POWs in Croatia in World War II. It is a fact that in my association with the independent state of Croatia and their authorities, their actions were exemplary and adhered to international law. Within the limits of their resources and facilities, the Croatian people provided timely and competent assistance to the United States Armed Forces personnel during the period of World War II.